the biological. Minka Gilliam's woven sculptures have been examining the connection between the organic and the synthetic for decades. Choosing polyester monofilament as her material of choice for its translucent glass-like quality, which allows the viewer to catch glimpses of the often complex internal structure through the thin transparent shells. Minka is living proof that both motherhood and a professional art practice can coexist. But in her pursuit to prove herself, the tight deadline for the first solo exhibition after childbirth almost took her life. Faced with the reality of immortality at a young age has had a profound impact on Minka's works on paper and woven sculptures that examine the nature of our bodies, our relationship to the synthetic and organic world around us, both physical and mental. Minka's practice ultimately involves a mix of conceptual issues around the relationship of the human body to the world and aesthetic concerns that arise from these formal relationships. Tonight, we get the pleasure of gaining further insights into Minka's process and her incredible exhibition, Mind Garden, where viewers are delighted with an array of colorful woven suspended sculptures to explore from a distance and up close, getting lost in the details and fully immersing themselves in the experience. Minka has been a practicing artist for over 20 years. Already with nine solo exhibitions and a swagger of group exhibitions to her name, and there's still lots more to do and create. From the central coast of New South Wales, we welcome this week's Friday feature artist, Minka Gillian. Hi, how are you? Hi, Minka, how are you going? Good, good. Thank you so much for joining us. Ah, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Now, we've got um, people watching and for people um, that are new to Friday Feature Artists, you are more than happy or we're more than happy for you to ask questions and leave comments within um, the comments uh, thread of this post. Um, Minka, I'd love to hear from you and so would I. And, yeah, it's just a great way to engage and make these lives something really unique and, and special. But, um, yeah, so please feel free to, to say hi and, um, yeah, show some love. But to, we've got a lot to get through tonight, Minka. You've you've had an amazing career as an as an artist, um, and I can't wait to share your fascinating sculptures and drawings with people. I wanted to start, if it's okay with you, with your mm -hmm. most recent um, exhibition, which is how I actually found out about you through um, mm -hmm. Tara Axford. Actually, managed to go to one of your exhibitions and met you there. Yes, yes, and that was Mind Garden. Yeah, I would love to hear about Mind Garden, how it came about and what your thought process was around around that exhibition. And I'll pop um I'll pop some images up. Um okay. and Julie says Julie says hello to fantastic. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? Saying hi to people. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is strange. <laughs> yeah, such amazing work. Certainly is. Oh, thanks. Yeah. And I've got um, um yeah, images to pop up two of your work. So I'll pop them up as you're talking. Okay. So um, Mind Garden uh, was an exhibition and an installation that um, I had last year and also um, some of this year as well. And uh, the shot you're looking at now is uh, the installation and it was in the um, incinerator art space in Sydney. Uh, so behind it, you can see the old um, industrial doors. And um, it was made up of uh, over, over 120 sculptures, individual sculptures that I hung in a format so that you could uh, sort of like a C shape so that you could walk into the installation and be surrounded by all this work. So um, it's called Mind Garden because it's my uh, imaginary internal landscape. And so by having it uh, so people can walk into it, that was me sort of allowing people to enter into my, my world or my brain in, in a, a way. And uh, each sculpture 
was an individual sculpture in its own right, but um, put together it made um, sort of, uh, yeah, made more sense to me to, to have them all together because each one is sort of uh, an emotion or a, a memory or um, a sort of a playful uh, experiment with materials and I guess to try and capture what goes on in my head, <laughs> I had to have a lot of elements because <laughs> there's a lot that goes on in there and uh, I wanted to, people to feel really uh, enveloped by the artworks. Yeah. yeah, they're just beautiful. I, um, I absolutely love them. How did the exhibition come about? Um, so uh, it was all based on that one installation. So there were other parts to the exhibition, but that, that installation had been in my head for over two years and I just hadn't found the right space for it because um, it had, to, it had to be hung. I knew, I knew I wanted it hung. I knew I wanted it on a grid and there aren't aren't a lot of galleries that that could do that and um at my my show before that um ghost heart i met um an artist called ann newmont and she suggested uh the incinerator art space because it has this amazing grid that's um on a trolley system so you can sort of bring it up or put it down and that was just perfect for for this exhibition when um i was re like discovered your work i saw that you put an amazing um video of you lying under your work as it was coming oh, yeah. down was <laughs> it on your yeah. facebook or your instagram i i can't remember where i saw well, it but it was probably, probably both <laughs> yeah that, yeah that was that was a very uh impromptu thing i i i really felt um this this exhibition was really sort of of my body and of my mind, so I really wanted to, uh, yeah, feel that it, uh, even more. So, so <laughs> yes, yeah. so I, I lay amongst it. Yeah, yeah. it, it had yeah. been something I wanted to do the whole time the show was on, but uh, um, I was sort of you know too busy looking after the show to actually lie around underneath it but because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were there fun. the whole time you were at the exhibition yes. the whole time yeah. Yeah. yeah is that normal is that uh depends on well this was a higher um gallery so um run through the council willoughby council so in this case that's the normal thing that you would look after your own show and so i think it was on for about three weeks or something, and uh, it was on right at the sort of start of COVID. Oh, no, it wasn't. Sorry, it was on just as we were sort of coming back out of um, uh, sort of self-isolation. So, yeah. and, and, and it was coming into spring. So it was actually really fortuitous timing for me um, because I think people started feeling, this is in Australia, started feeling a bit more hopeful and uh, feeling, um, you know, desperate to, to come out of their homes again and to, uh, you know, to see something happy and fun. So, yeah, that was good. And what an amazing experience for you as well because I would imagine when you're exhibiting in a gallery space, like a, mm. a, an owned gallery, that you don't have that privilege of being there That's and seeing right. the responses from people. Um, what yeah. were some of your favourite responses from people? Oh, um, I, well, I had, a, I had lots of kids love it and uh, I, had, um, I had one sculpture that... Uh, People could add things to. They were little um, little bits of origami paper that, that they would write a wish on and fold and then add to the sculpture. So uh, the kids loved that part. Um, but 
Uh, I think um, people just felt really uplifted and um, it was quite a joyful, playful uh, exhibition. So mostly people just talked about joy and, uh, and what a relief it was uh, to, um, to see something light. Yeah, yeah. Because when you think about, um, I guess, traditional weaving in a way, you think of natural materials, you think of, um, you know, browns, neutral colours. So mm. to look at your work and and see weaving done in this way that's so unconventional, using unconventional materials mm. and such vibrant colour, it's joyful. It really is mm. joyful. I, uh, I was actually surprised at how joyful it came out because there were also a lot of, uh, you know, I used uh, black electrical cords and lots of ca black cable ties and lots of spiky things. And there were some sculptures that were a bit sort of darker, but the overall effect was really uh, positive, which I was glad about, but also surprised about. Yeah, yeah. Is it a conscious choice to use colour in your weaving? Um, so I, I like to use colour as a challenge to myself. Um, I don't always, um, I don't always like colour, <laughs> but I, I, I like to find a material that's a really strong colour and then uh, use, it, use it as a challenge to, to make something out of, to, um, yeah, you, but usually by working with that colour, I end up liking the colour. So I suppose mm -hmm. um, it started as a challenge, but now I'm sort of just gradually liking and accepting all colours. <laughs> yeah. But um, blue, blue is my safety colour. Uh, yeah. I, I, I love blue and I, I find that that's... That feels very precious and safe to me. And so, um, yeah, my blue sculptures are always more special to me than other sculptures. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, that's gorgeous. And you sold quite a lot of them in Mind Garden. What's, what's happening with that exhibition now? So, well, so it's, uh, it, it's already had another show. Um, down in a gallery in Bowral, uh, and I added more sculptures to that. So I, I sold lots and then had to make up the numbers again because I, I don't know why. It was silly. In my head I had a certain number I wanted to have and, uh, yeah, didn't want it to fall below that number. So in the end, the second time I exhibited it, it had more actually. And this this is uh, the third. Of the image now that's the third time it's wow. been exhibited. that's a little yep. mini yep. mini one so that's on at the moment at uh the uh ted max civic park in north sydney but oh, yes yeah, so that's a t that's a little a little one and yeah. uh, but my plan is for this to grow and to change because each sculpture's it's it's sort of like a little uh, a thought exercise or a, um, a sculptural sketch. So mm. they can be quite fast, fast things to make when um, the majority of my work is actually very uh, slow to make. So, um, and, and I think more serious. So this, this is more my playful side, but uh, I definitely want it to grow and to change and to uh, suit different um, different situations. So yeah, I really love that image of them, and it looked like they were outside in nature. Um, could you actually? I mean, because they're made of plastic predominantly. Could you sell them and say yes, you can hang them outside like a outdoor? Um, I, I wouldn't be comfortable with that because uh, they will fade. The colours yeah. will fade after a while and, and it will become weathered. I mean, it, yeah. it would probably take a really long time, but 
Um, so I did have a fluoro, a fluoro uh, sculpture I gave my father years and years ago, and he hung it in a window. And uh, that was there for, I mean, still there, but it's completely clear now. There's no fluoro element in it at all. Um, but that that's, oh, it's probably been there more than 20 years, though. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, so that's kind of comforting. So if you've, got to have, you've got to have it inside, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and a, a few of them ended up in New Zealand. Is that correct? In a in a yes. hotel? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, the QT Art Hotel opened up a new um, a new hotel in Auckland um, just earlier. Oh, at the end of last year, and they bought uh, ten pieces from Mind Garden to hang in. Um, uh, in a especially made alcove, bright red alcove in their foyer. So that was pretty exciting. Have you got images of that? Um, I don't. That They've been slowly releasing their media package and yeah. so my, yeah. my photo hasn't come out yet. I've got photos but I don't, I, I think, then I want to save it for the nicer photos. <laughs> so, yeah, of course. The professional photos. So, yes, yeah. I do. I have yeah. seen it and it looks good. Looks at home there. So Good. Yeah, that's awesome. It, it, it's quite funny because I've actually, I've actually bought fishing line in New Zealand. I've got family in New Zealand and I've bought fishing line and I've actually made sculptures in New Zealand as well. So it's kind of nice that now... Sculptures yeah. going back. Mm. That's lovely. Photography is quite an important aspect of your creative process. And mm. I was listening to one of your um, other interviews today, and you you were giving advice to people, or I think it might have even been mm. students, about documenting your work and how yeah. important that is. Yeah. How, how does that work for you? Um. So that was something I probably learnt the hard way uh, by initially not taking good photos of my work and uh, I missed out on a, um, a residency when I was still at art school um, in Paris because of the quality of my or oh. lack of quality of my photos. So that, that really <laughs> hurt at the time. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and also I didn't think that I could take photos uh, I didn't have the money to get them professionally done, so I was trying to do them myself, and they just weren't good enough. Um, I've invested money in good cameras, and um, my husband's a very good photographer, so he takes, he's uh, more of a perfectionist than I am, so he takes the majority of my photos for me. Um, yeah. But I, I guess I didn't realize um, initially. Uh, that photos of your work often live on and live different lives to the actual work itself as well. So uh, especially now with social media, um, you know, images, you can use images of long lost sculptures or whatever um, that, uh, yeah, mm. and, and for, you know, publications and, you know, it's it's really important. It's um probably more people see photos of your work than they see of your work in real life these days, especially if you're, um, you know, sending things overseas. So, yeah, so it's really yeah. it's really important. Um, and also I now it's, it's because the photos we take are of such good quality, now they've actually become an art form in themselves as well so it's feeding back into my drawing and um into my painting and yeah mm. it's a, it's a interesting uh tool now as well i'm just showing some of the images that are beautifully shot and on that black background they just pop mm. don't, i don't, don't like that word pop but no they do they do, they do pop <laughs> <laughs> so a great contrast. So um, um, we 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 had 
they look great, but there's also a lot of struggle behind these because <laughs> my, my sculptures were getting bigger and bigger and we live in a, a small place and uh, I don't, my studios are completely jam-packed full of artwork, so you, they're hopeless for taking photos in. So most of the photos of my work were taken in our living room or our bedroom <laughs> with, a, you know, a, a black cloth held up and uh, pinned up and uh, we recently bought um, wooden boards which we painted black on one side and white on the other and they're under our house and we and we photograph things outside now. But um, things like uh, my mind garden, uh, you know, mm. that's... It's moving. It's moving all the time. Slightest bit of breeze, it moves. So that's actually a really hard one to capture. A yeah. little bit of video, so, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's actually, you know, we, we are much better at documenting my work, but it's an endless struggle, really. Yeah. And it's always, always a bit of a pain when it comes around to documenting, but it's something you have to do. Yes, mm. totally agree. Well, you're doing a marvellous job at it. It, it. They, Yeah, when you sent your images through, I was, I, I saw them on your website anyway, but I was like, oh, mm. yeah, this is cool. This is really makes makes it sing, makes the work sing. But mm. I, I have to ask, where, where did your love of weaving originate from? Um, so uh, my father mostly. So when uh, I was little, they used to have basket making gatherings at our house. And so I think the first ever basket I made was a pine needle basket about, you know, this big, which I think I then kept cinnamon sticks in as logs for my Barbie. Um, but um, then That's later so on, <laughs> yeah, she must have had a, a, a fire. She had a, lo a basket of logs. But anyway, <laughs> I don't remember a fire, but she had she had the logs in the basket. But um, <laughs> so my dad um, uh, is a, is uh, known in the basket weaving world as uh, the Willow Man, and so he he's had an interest in in basket making for a long time, and as as has my mum, but my mum did more sort of plaited and raffia work and coiling, that kind of thing. And so my dad, when I was about 17 or something or 16 or 17, he enrolled me in a class, a uh, basket, uh, what was it, jewellery making with basket making techniques. And he did it with me as sort of, you know, a bonding exercise. And, which I, I was sort of a bit reluctant to do, but but in the end loved it. And then uh, we both joined the basket makers of Tasmania and um, uh, it's, uh, Gwen Egg and Ruth Hadlow, I think, were my sort of first teachers. And they're both uh, fibre artists. Yeah. Yeah. I love that legacy that you've carried on through your dad and we'll try and find a link to the Willow Man um, and, yeah. <laughs> and pop him up there so people can look him up, like how cool. Yeah, yeah. He, must be really, he must be proud of you and, and vice versa. That's really great. Yeah. Got that finality. It, it, it's quite funny though. Uh, neither of us could do each other's work either. Yeah. Like I, look, I, I hate Willow working. Well, I like the look of it hate working with it it's really um it breaks easy it's a real sort of struggle it's a physical struggle and yeah. uh, and then my work's too small and fiddly and slippery for my father so <laughs> so yeah. we both admire each other's work but yeah don't do anything similar to each other yeah mm. where did your love for where did your interest in the biomorphic type shapes and that connection with the um the filament originate from so um originally i was working in uh natural materials um i we i grew up in a house where you, you know you, you make everything yourself and you um we we're very frugal and I loved the idea that you could make, seemingly make something from nothing. So uh, natural materials were sort of 
free and easy to use and all I needed was sometimes a, ne- a needle and a pocket knife and, or scissors and that was it. And I loved, loved the simplicity. But um, uh, when in my third year of art school, I started introducing my weaving into my artwork. I was majoring in sculpture and I was making uh, voodoo dolls uh, and they're all made out of New Zealand flax and human hair and little oh, wow. odds and ends like that. But um, I actually got really sick and I became allergic to all the natural materials I was working with. And uh, so um, one of my teachers, my lecturer at the time, uh, Bob Jennings, he, uh, he suggested working with plastics and metal and uh and once I got onto it I was hooked and uh yeah been doing it ever since ah that's fantastic so really out of necessity it came about it was yeah just yeah 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 Yeah. that's beautiful I'd love to talk about sorry I was just gonna say it still hurts to have to buy materials (laughs) <laughs> that's why a lot a lot of materials are found materials as well because i i hate i hate having to spend money on <laughs> materials especially being a weaver when you can walk out your front door and on the nature's I know. Roof. <laughs> I know and there's a there's heaps of lamandra near my house yeah. which yeah. i know is a is a good weaving material but i've, I've never i've never used it unfortunately but i look oh. at it and I'm very That's envious awesome. of anyone with flax plants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'd love to talk about your um, exhibition that we showed with the beautiful photos called Ghost Heart. Mm-hmm. And people might, and I was shocked to learn that this piece here is actually yes. taller than you. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that that was a monster to make. That was a... That actually took me years to make uh, because uh, it was so big and so hard to handle. Um, the inner core of most of it is um, electrical wire and it was quite thick, floppy electrical wire as well. So it was actually, um, yeah, it was quite a struggle to work with. And this is, I think, the only piece I've got where I've worked with uh, some recycled um fishing line as well because uh, mostly fishing line uh, once it's used sort of it loses its gloss and it becomes a bit sort of rough and brittle and also you don't usually come across it um, not tangled up but uh, the bottom section of this is recycled very thick uh, trawler line I guess but um, yeah this was that was a physical struggle to make that one but I Ever since, so I have an 11-year-old son and so for the past 11 years, basically, I feel like as soon as I got pregnant, my work started growing bigger and bigger as soon as I was getting bigger and bigger. And and ever since then, my work just keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know quite why that is, but uh, <laughs> I think... Um, I think it has something to do with uh, becoming sort of more more open. I think you become quite open when you become a parent. And uh, my work before was very small and internal and had lots of sort of internal parts that were hidden. It was very sort of inward looking. And I think having a child has made me sort of open up and be more outward looking, I think. And I think my work directly sort of related to to what's happening with my body and emotions I think yeah that's um that's that's fascinating how you talk about that being yeah working inwards and then it becoming bigger and bigger and bigger mm. I wonder wonder where it's going to end up ah who knows <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was it was it hard making that? Or what was it like making that tradition uh, transition? I guess from being seen as an artist to then being, I guess, identified or labelled as a mum by the mm. art community. Uh, it was 
really hard, um, partly because I moved uh, when I was pregnant to a new suburb. So, and I, I didn't really know people with kids. So I didn't have a community of mothers around me. And all the new mothers I met, uh, none of them were artists. So I felt a little bit sort of isolated and misunderstood as well because I remember saying things like, oh, God, I, I just, I need to work. I can't, I can't wait to get back into my artwork and, uh, and still, you know, continue being an artist. And they would say, oh, you know, don't worry, you just have to wait four years and, and it will be easier after four years. But to me, that seemed like a really, really long time. It almost seemed like a death sentence to me to have to wait four years. But uh, in the end, um, so when I had my son, I, I gave myself uh, three months maternity leave, I think it was. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and then, <Not> yeah, <laughs> I thought that was long enough, <laughs> to be honest. I was, itching. I was itching to get back to work and, um, and I was itching to prove to myself and to others that um, becoming a mother didn't diminish my artistic life and that I was going to continue. But uh, um, I ended up sort of uh, working myself way too hard and uh, ended up having, getting a, a pacemaker when my son was uh, very little and that was partly because I was working towards a, a solo and my work was getting, as I said, bigger and bigger and bigger and I was putting a lot of pressure on myself and, um, yeah, so the day, I think the day my sh solo show opened, so I finished it, I finished the work, uh, but I ended up in hospital and I, they wouldn't let me out for my exhibition opening, <laughs> I said, uh, because I was getting a pacemaker the next day. And I, I said, I'll sign something that says, you know, it's not your fault if I die, please just let me out. But no, they wouldn't. <laughs> So the only time I got to see that show was the day it ended. Yeah, so that was a bit sad. Mm -hmm. But at least I got to see it. And did you, did you, uh, and were they big pieces, like really big pieces as well in that, in that uh, solo? Well, for, for, for the, for me at that time, yes, they were big. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Sort of like uh, probably some a metre high. Uh, I've, I'm, now make bigger work, but at that time that was big. For that would be, yeah. 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 That that last um, Eva, um, hi Eva, by the way from Sweden. She asked, um, "How big was that last piece that that we showed?" Um, so that's so about so I think I'm about one thirty, about one fifty three. Mm. I think so. Wow. So about that. <laughs> so about Maybe. Yeah, yeah amazing mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so that's centimeters by the way guys so yeah um, yeah, yeah amazing <laughs> i'm not sure exactly yeah. how tall i am but yeah i get the feeling you put yourself under a lot of pressure to get the work done <laughs> yeah. yeah look i i do because um it's laborious it's it's very repetitive um there's no fast way to do it. You know, it's just over, under, over, under. There's, there's nothing other than uh, finding someone else to do it for you or getting a machine mm. to do it. I don't know if there is one that can do it. But um, there's nothing you can do but just keep slogging away. And I yeah. think uh, yeah. I think I definitely got that that from my dad, you know, he's a slow worker, but he just plods on, you know, with everything that he does. And I think I'm the same. Yeah. We just, yeah. Is it stick to itiveness or something? <laughs> we yeah. stick to it. We just yeah. Do it. yeah. I think that's nice about that generation as well. They just had, they didn't have, well, the way I 
I guess my excuse for not mm. sticking and being methodical about things is that mm. I've just too many distractions. <laughs> Whereas mm. I feel like, and that's what I worry about with my kids' generation as well, is they're not going to learn how to be still and go deep within mm. and just be methodical mm. about things because they're so used to that um, that dopamine hit of those instant mm. distractions that are happening everywhere in this life. So I, I, I think so. I'm very aware of time and and energy and I I used to say I've only got so much time and energy and and so if I've already invested a day in a sculpture and it's not working out or whatever I, I still have to keep going I just have to keep pushing because I've already invested that time and energy and I don't want to waste it I think uh yeah so that's yeah, I, I think there's no such thing as a failed artwork. It's just not resolved yet. So you just have to keep keep going at it, <laughs> basically. Yeah. 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 I'd love to share with people your gorgeous drawings and the fact that I don't know if anyone else has noticed, but they're actually portraits of your sculptures, which I found yes. was just glorious, just glorious. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, I'd love to talk a little bit um, about that. And one of the images that you sent through or a couple of them that sent through, um, and do you need a break, by the way? Do you want to have a quick break? No, okay. okay, great. So, okay, great. One of my favourite images that you sent through was this one here. I just loved it. Can you talk a little oh, bit about you. that and how that yep. came about? So this one's called uh, The Origin of the World after Corbet. And uh, Corbet was a, uh, a painter who um, painted a very sort of risque picture basically of uh, a woman leaning back on a bed, I assume, but all you see basically is her thighs and vagina and it's called The Origin of the World. So this is my version of the origin of the world based on uh, a series of bound doilies that uh, I've made sculptures about and other drawings about. And so the central part is based on the doily and, um, and of course, female uh, sexual organs as well. And then the large circle is the egg and around it a uh, little sperm and uh, so with my drawings i usually start by um uh splattering sort of paint or ink onto the drawer onto the paper just randomly and i'll probably do it on maybe about 40 pieces of paper this, that one I didn't because it was way too big to fit in my living room on the floor, but um, I, I think I did four of them or something. But normally I would do about 40 and I uh, sort of squish them together like a raw shark image and once they're all dry, then I sit down with photos or look around my living room at my sculptures and I try and match the sculpture to the splodge. And then I work in, into it and I, I guess I'm sort of remembering the motion of weaving as I'm drawing as well and I'm trying to replicate um, the woven form and sort of create my own sort of uh, woven language in the, in the drawing. And uh, sometimes, uh, so the sculptures, especially... Uh, the more ornate ones. They have so many beautiful corners and curves and nooks and crannies that um, sometimes I just want to focus on those sections. Uh, and by drawing them, I, I get to revisit the sculpture. And um, yeah, it's sort of, it's a, also another way of keeping the sculpture. <laughs> if I keep the yeah. drawing, then yeah. I get. Uh, yeah, I get to relive the, the sculpture through the drawing. It's so Because you spend so a lot of time cool. with it when you're making sculptures. So 
you get to know them so inside and out. So it's uh, it's nice to revisit like that. Yeah, yeah, they're incredible. Um, Julie's asked a really great question. Thank you, Julie. Um, do you plan your sculptures or are they made intuitively as you work? Thanks, Julie. Um, hi, Julie. Um, both, basically. Um, uh, sometimes I'm really inspired by the material, um, particularly if it's a material that's going to be thrown out, I suddenly get this overwhelming desire to make something with it, <laughs> to save it, give it a new life. Um, uh, sometimes I want to make something about a particular uh, emotion or event in my life. Um, and yeah, and, and sometimes um, nearly nearly everything I make is uh, a body of work. I don't don't usually make just individual pieces, sit alone pieces. It's usually about something that's going on in my life. Um, so, yeah, it's a mix, a mixture of both pretty much. Yeah, yeah. But I, I pretty much n never draw and sketch and plan a drawing uh, for a sculpture, not in that way. Um, I mm. might have it in my head, but I don't really sketch it. Mm. I loved how you were talking about, well, those, those ink splotches and um, this piece here sort of demonstrates that really well like there's the ink underneath it and then the yeah. the gorgeous and, and is that representative of that piece there the blue piece no uh oh. i don't think you've got an example of that one that one was a sculpture yeah. called that was in ghost heart and that was called relic right. and the little the little uh sort of mushroom shaped bits they're mm. actually uh they represent needle caps uh, my mother's a diabetic and uh, every time she has uh, her injections, she saves the lids and I use the lids in my sculptures. So for me, you know, they represent my mother, they represent time, they represent uh, sort of um, uh, sort of routine and, uh, yeah, and also I guess sickness as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How did you get back into drawing after sort of being a little bit disconnected from it for a while? So uh, when COVID-19 happened, I uh, assumed my Mind Garden exhibition wasn't going to go ahead. I thought it would be pushed off to the next year. So I just sort of stopped for a little while and thought, uh, you know, I, ha I don't have to push myself so hard. I've got time to play. And... At the same time, I was helping my son with his online schooling and part of that was an art class and uh, he, I sort of did his art class with him and a lot of that was to do with um, stenciling and um, just painting and drawing and, uh, yeah, I got quite quite excited by it and... Uh, that sort of triggered that off. Um, I had been drawing previously. I spent the last sort of five years um, concentrating on making drawing a habit in my life again um, mm. because it had stopped for a while there. And I, yeah, so I sort of developed a bit of a negative dialogue, internal dialogue with, about drawing. So uh, that was something I consciously wanted to overcome and uh yeah I, I sort of discovered for me the important thing about drawing is um is just finding finding your material finding the material that you love and and of course the subject matter as well so um yeah and luckily I, I felt like I found that during uh COVID um and so originally um I wasn't going to have drawings in my uh, mind garden exhibition, but I ended up exhibiting um, oh, maybe maybe about 30, 30 drawings or something. Yeah, so yeah. it was great. 
I love that. I love how your son sort of reinvigorated yeah. something in you without even know. knowing it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I find um, I think kids, kids do really uh, change or can really change how you work and I think they give mm. you an excuse to revisit childhood and, and to play and to not take yourself so seriously as well and, yeah, I yeah. think that's, that's pretty pretty invaluable I think yeah I remember eagerly like I got close I we I have two children and we spent a lot of time working with our younger one during you know homeschooling but our daughter who's um 14 going almost on 15 and she was studying Goethe's color theory and she was doing oh, right. these beautiful watercolor pictures and oh, all this and I know I would just be getting closer and closer and closer to her <laughs> like all set up on the kitchen table and and then you know because they do like um three weeks of it's called the main lesson so they do three mm. weeks of an hour and a half or two hours of this intensive study mm. on one subject which is beautiful because the kids can absorb into it um so, you know, like it had come to nine o'clock, you know, the next day and be like, oh, we ready for colour theory? Like, uh, <laughs> someone's like, are you sitting in again? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I realised I, 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 you know, my my help with my son's artwork wasn't uh, wasn't so appreciated. <laughs> I had to leave him to do his own thing in the end. I think I was getting too yeah. involved. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I know what you mean. My kids had quite an education today when I was Googling the, the Corbet image and, and they came oh. home from school. And, oh, was it last night? And they've gone, what, what, is, what are you looking at? I'm like, well, I was trying to explain to them. And then um, if That's you funny. research that piece of artwork, there's been some controversy and people getting oh, arrested. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and, and so, so many funny. other artists have, uh, have uh, referenced it as well. So, yeah. yeah. Fascinating. There's a whole world out there. I'm totally it's funny that in this in this day and age, it's still controversial in some ways. Yeah, it's stupid, yeah. really. But anyway, yeah, yeah. I love your collages too, Minko. It just seems like there's no end to your um, artistic abilities and how you you use layering. I mean, your sculptures are so layered. You know, you mm. just bring into this quite complex detail of, around the, a simple form, but then you have this way of doing that again with your artwork and especially your collages and the piece mm. behind you is just yep. incredible. I'd love to talk about it. And, oh, <laughs> sorry. I didn't know. Know. I was trying to get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, it's just stunning. And, and here's a process image um, for everyone to see because can you talk about how you this piece came about and, and how it's mm. evolving as it, as it goes along? Yeah. So uh, so it started with a photograph. So that's a photograph of me standing, holding basically, they're sort of like the, the, the guts of, of some sculptures. So each one of those is now turned into a separate sculpture and they were sort of like the internal sections of the sculptures. And uh, I wanted a photo of myself with them because I feel like... Um, being an artist, you really sort of expose yourself and sort of lay yourself out in front of people to be judged or to be praised or whatever. But you, yeah. uh, uh, yes, it's a strange feeling because um, uh, it's it's just sort of you know that push and pull of being a private person but a public person, you know. Uh, so uh, so it started with a photo and then I started drawing on the photo uh, and realised that I, um, I, don't, I, I get a bit sort of um, carried away with mark making and I ran out of, ran out of room. I crowded the image basically. Mm. So then I had to, um, I sewed on more paper onto the image to give it more space, but it still didn't have enough space. I was still then crowding that that out. Uh, I find it very hard to leave room, and I know it's important to leave room to breathe in a picture, but mm. uh, I, I find that difficult. I get too carried away. So 
Just the other day, I sewed that image onto a bigger canvas uh, to give it more, so that's behind me, to give it more space. And then I've drawn onto the canvas as well. Yeah. That's cool. So, yeah. But that, this is sort of um, uh, recently all my drawings sort of come out looking sort of a bit spiritual or uh, religious. Um, mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not mm. religious, but I think art is sort of, uh, it's sort of my, my guiding uh, sort of, uh, let's say my guiding light that sounds a bit funny, but anyway, it's, it's my, um, it's my religion basically. And yeah. I am attracted to, uh, to a lot of um, religious imagery, um, but, uh, but I'm not religious, yeah. So when I was, uh, I don't know, maybe about 15, 14, 15, I visited an uncle who was studying to be a priest and he, had, uh, he took me to a, an exhibition of um, Russian Orthodox icons and I think that, that had a, a really big influence on me and my, uh, my paintings. So ever, ever since then, I've been sort of a bit obsessed with halos and gold and sort of iconography. Uh, so there is a bit of that feel to this one. Yeah. 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 Well, it's 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 absolutely stunning. Um, Bernadette, yeah, she totally agrees as well. Very spiritual. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and it's stunning. And there's a little bit of you in that piece, definitely. Um, <laughs> There's yeah. quite a lot of <laughs> quite a lot, literally. And literally. <laughs> People probably tell us can't about your birthday. Go on, tell us about what you're doing. All right, birthday. all right. Yeah, go so on. it was just just my birthday on St Patrick's Day, and uh, I said that I wasn't going to make any art on my birthday. I was going to have the day off, so I spent some time reading art books and. Uh, <laughs> And relaxing. And then I started, of course, but that didn't last long. And then I, I just started sort of getting a bit sort of itchy to do some artwork. And, uh, and I, I became a bit overwhelmed by all the choices that I could do on my day off. Because, uh, you know, art's what I do every day, but it's also what I do on my days off and for fun. And anyway, so... I can't remember exactly how this started, but uh, so I needed to prepare the canvas before I uh, sewed on my image in the picture behind me. And uh, because the image is it's sort of about being a mother, it's about being vulnerable, it's about um, sort of uh, nurturing uh, creativity and nurturing yourself, Anyway, so I ended up deciding that I wanted to uh, do a breast painting. <laughs> so all the background in this painting is actually I painted my left breast and then I pressed it up on the canvas uh, repeatedly until the whole canvas was covered in breasts. And then, then I've painted over it in uh, various um, glazes and I've wiped it back in some sections so that you can see the marks more clearly. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I liked the idea of sort of like, you know, what is it, the milk of human kindness, you know, or uh, yeah. I liked, yeah, that sort of nurturing but also... I suppose sexual as well. Uh, I feel like um, growing up, uh, when you see um, women in in art, they're either sort of virgins or whores or um, or muses, and you know there was this sort of wasn't much in between um, when I was growing up. 
So I guess I, I grew up wanting to be an artist but also wanting to be a muse and having that, uh, that uh, sort of mix. So I decided that, that I would be my muse uh, that I didn't need to be someone else's muse. So, yeah, so that's all sort of mixed up in that painting as well. That's incredible. Uh, that mm. makes sense? <laughs> it does. It does make perfect sense. Mm. Yeah. And it is so deep. Like we could have a giggle and go, oh, we painted our boobs. Yeah. But really, it's th you're, you're I, muse. I also think it's also something to be, to do with being a sculptor. Mm. Like I really mm. have to get my hands involved in the things that I do and I physically, so it's, it's uh, uh, just drawing or painting. It's, it's too far removed sometimes from, from my brain, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. so the, the action of, of pressing the canvas on me uh, was, uh, yeah, almost performative sculptural act somehow. Yes, you know? yes. And, of course, more immediate image making. Yes. yes. And that idea of never really work, like wanting to start a piece or on a blank canvas. So mm. you're confronted yes. with a blank canvas or a blank piece of paper and immediately thinking, like, not what do I have to draw, but making the mark and then what do I have mm. to respond to? I, I also like the sort of the time factor as well. So I know that they are my, or that is my left boob when I was 46, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as well. I, like, I think that that's sort of capturing something in history <laughs> with the time. <laughs> I like that too. I like that too. I think that's fantastic. What's next for you, Minka? I mean, you've got these beautiful collages, you've got beautiful drawings, sculptures. What's mm. Where is your heart taking you now? Um, so this year I want to really concentrate on drawing and painting and to uh, develop that side of my uh, practice. Um, I'll continue to make sculpture as well. I never, you know, stop with that basically. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I really want to develop my uh, my yeah, drawing and painting. Uh, I've got a series in my head that I want to do of quite large, large drawings as well, larger than my my uh, myself. Yeah, possibly, possibly the drape on the ground. So, yeah. Yeah, I've got quite a few things planned in my head. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. And and the irony is is that, you know, we live in a small house and it's got a lot of stuff in it and I'm getting less and less room. And uh, I, I have two studios and I can't work in either of them. There's, it's just so much uh, work and materials. And so I work in the living room and it, it's not it's not ideal but, you know, yeah. Are your, studios, are your studios rooms within the house or are they external to your home? Or? Uh, yeah, they're rooms in the house, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So yeah. The, the painting behind me, uh, I've been drawing that sitting at the couch but the sewing onto the canvas had to be done in the kitchen because <laughs> there, was, there was more room there. So, yeah, but that's mm. okay. Well, you know, make it make it happen. Yeah. Well, you do whatever you're doing, it's working. And I feel Thank like you. art making's a, a whole body experience and it should be a whole house experience as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It's a little unfair on the rest of the family. Ah, oh, they'll get over it. Don't worry. Uh, you know, <laughs> they enjoy it, I think. I'm sure it's good for them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I've just had such a great time getting to know you and um, learning more about you, the deeper meaning behind your work, and and mm. and it's just just beautiful that that gorgeous translucent materials that you use, and then these stunning drawings that come from it, and yeah, they almost look like you know 
fine oil paintings and just the way the way that you make your marks is, is really mm. gorgeous so um oh, thank you i hope that it continues for you really really positively i can't wait to see how big your pieces actually get um mm. i was telling you last night we work with a lady and she does huge big sculptures and um i think that if there's a will there's a way yeah definitely. yeah if it's in you, it'll it'll be it'll have to be birthed. Yeah. But funnily enough, I've always wanted to do um, miniature erotic paintings. Oh. <laughs> so maybe I'll be contrary and go completely miniature. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Something you need to do in a small room of the house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's gorgeous. Well, thank you. Minka, so much. We'll pop links up to your website and your in beautiful Instagram so people can follow along and, um, yeah, get to know you a little bit more and uh, hopefully head to one of your gorgeous exhibitions as well. So, um, yeah, keep us updated. If, if anything comes to Melbourne or if we get up to Sydney, we'll certainly, yeah, um, try and make it to one for sure. It'd be really, Excellent. really good. Thanks. Yeah. All right. But Lovely before talking we go, to you. Oh, yeah. thank you. Um, before we go, Minka, though, I'd love to ask you if there was a quote or something you'd like to be remembered for as an artist and mm. what would that be? Mm. Ooh. Um, mm, I, I, I don't know if I have a... Oh, I don't know if I have a really good quote, but there, there was something that my uh, one of my lecturers said to me uh, he said basically that for every every sort of six every crap no what did he say he said for every six pieces of art you know five will be crap and one will be good so if you just acknowledge that at the beginning then it takes the pressure off <laughs> yeah. so but I think as you, as you I think that's a good quote for when you're beginning, but I think uh, as you get get on, you know, your, your chances of successful artworks get better. But um, oh, I guess I I don't know what I want to want people to take away from my work. I suppose just um, a moment of. Um, hmm, just sort of transport them to, to somewhere else, somewhere pleasant. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not really not really sure. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't got a great quote. <laughs> no, no, not at all. You, you said something that was quite profound earlier, actually, that um, I don't know if it's, it's already an existing saying, but art, art is my religion, and I just went, wow, mm. that's... That's really gorgeous. Um, mm. I can certainly see that looking at you and, and the image behind you now. So mm. um, certainly something that I'm gonna that's that sticks with me. And and yeah, for every for every six, you know, there's there's one yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> just keep going. Just honoring that process, isn't it? Just honoring the process. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and just believing, believing, sort of letting letting go of the control a bit and letting whatever it is just come out i think uh, yeah. as you get older you listen to yourself more and and worry less about what other people think and uh, i think you sort of make truer truer work i think yeah well, i hope so, hope so anyway yeah yeah well there's something about your work that's just amazing so yeah if it's only going to get better with age then yeah i look forward to that too <laughs> I yeah. hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you once again, Minka, and thanks for everyone for watching. It was so lovely to see um, some like lots of lots of familiar faces, and there was a few, lots of comments, Minka, but I didn't put them all up on the screen. But mm -hmm. we're going to play a little slideshow now, and that'll give people a chance to say thank you. And um, okay. yeah, it was just lovely. Right. So all the best with the ongoing Mind Garden and and, and all you. your massive pieces of work. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone.